Good evening. We are finally continuing in our Agarata series. I ask uh, forgiveness from all of you for how long it's taken since our last Agarata class until now. But Bazaar Hashem, I hope to be running through quite consistently this summer. We are on page, well, it really depends which kind of Talmud you have in front of you. But attached to the Zoom invitation are two different types of Talmuds. We have the regular Talmud Bavni, as well as the En Yaakov, which is what's in front of me right now. In any Talmud that you are in, you want to look for Masechet Berachot, Tractate Berachot, page 3a. So Gimel Amud Aleph. If you're going to be using the En uh, en Yaakov uh, that I attached, you would like to find yourself on, also it says page Gimel at the top. In a regular Talmud Bavli, you're going to be on page 3a. Tonight's show was dedicated by Alan and Dina Sigmund. Lilu Nishmat Chaim Yehuda Ben Natan. Hamarachem Akol Buda Veyechus Veyechmod Veyechem Manefesh Ruach Uchama. Shel Haniftar B'Shem Tov Min Aulam Chaim Yehuda Ben Natan Ruach Adonai Tenachinu Maganet Enu Chobnet Tzach Shvim Mimchom Imo B'Chal Achinu B'Sedichot B'Chen Yirat Zon V'Lomar Amen. This is Shema Shel Hav Anidan Ganet And Bezrat Hashem Tzvach. So just an overview of what we're going to be doing now. Tonight, Bezrat Hashem, I am going to be reading you through this sugya, this section of the En Yaakov, once. And then again with the commentary of Rashi, we're going to make sure that we understand very well the Peshat, the simple meaning here of the Talmud. I'm going to ask a list of questions. If one of you doesn't mind writing down those questions and sending them out my way, Bezad Hashem, next week we're going to be looking one level deeper into the actual Peshat of the Talmud as understood by the different Mefarshim, the different commentaries. And then we will take this sugya one step at a time, deeper and deeper. This is a little bit different than many of our other shiurim. In this week's shiul, I'm going to be teaching you the Talmud so you can read it for yourself. From tonight until next week, Thursday night, I expect all of you who are in the shiul consistently to have reviewed this sugya a number of times, if you want, every single day. By the time we come here next week, the only way you're truly going to understand next week's shiul is if you almost know this Talmud by heart. I don't mean word for word. I mean the back and forth conversation that exists here. You should know exactly what happens in this page of Talmud. You shouldn't look at it next week and be a stranger to it. And then in the next week, and the next week, and the next week, as we peel back layers, you don't want to have to relearn this piece of Talmud every single week. You want to make sure that you know it well, because this is what we're going to be focused on for the next couple of weeks. So if you recall the first Mishnah of Masechet Barachot, we said, When do we read Shema? In the evening. What did Rabbi Eliezer say? The first opinion, there were three opinions. Rabbi Eliezer said, from Tzeta Kuchavim, when three stars come out, Ad Sof, until the end of? Until the end of? Who remembers the first Mishnah in Mazeret Barachot? The first opinion in the Talmud. Okay, in that case, we're going to have to review the Mishnah. What can I do? Let's review the Mishnah. So, you want to roll back until the beginning of the Masechet, where the top of the page in big fancy letters, it says, Ne'ematai. So let's read together. From when do we need Shema in the evening? Very good. From when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tehumah. We learned already then that that is the same exact time as when how many stars come out? Three. When three stars come out, that is when we begin to read Shema. You were there, right? Add until Sof HaRishona. Until the end of the first... The first watch. The first watch. Remember, there's changing of guards of Malachim and in the heavens, maybe even on the earth. Ad sof until the end of the first watch. Divrei Rabbi Eliezer. This is the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. Vachachamim umarim ad chatzot. Chachamim say until midnight. Rabban Gamliel omer ad shi'ale amuda shachar. And Rabban Gamliel says until dawn. 
So you have until the end of the first watch, Rabbi Eliezer. Until midnight, Chachamim. Until Alot HaShachar, dawn, that's Rabban Gamliel. And what did Rabban Gamliel teach us? That even the Chachamim agree with him. So if the Chachamim agree that you have the whole night until the morning to say Shema Yisrael, then why did the Chachamim say you only have until midnight? What was the answer of the Mishnah? Because you don't want to miss it. You want to make sure that you, you do. Very good. Kadei lahachik adam min avira. In order to keep a person away from an avira. You want to make sure you don't miss it completely. Okay, so let's start again. Rabbi Eliezer says that you can say Shema Yisrael until when? Until, no, from when three stars come out until when? In the end of the first watch. The end of the first watch. When is that? We don't know yet. We have not defined that yet. And it's exactly what we're going to deal with right now. Bezalat Hashem, the definition of the end of the first watch. So let's go back to your Talmud at the top of Gimel Amud Aleph. If you're looking in the classic Vilna edition, you want to find yourself a few lines down from the top. Is there an echo going on in the room that you hear? Yes, Rabbi. One second. We're going to pause the recording. Okay, we're back. We are now at the top of page Gimel Amur Aleph, so 3A. Whatever Talmud you have should say at the top 3A. If you're using my En Yaakov version, then you want to look for the page that has a Hebrew letter Gimel on top. Alright, and if you're using the Rabbi Steinzaltz edition like al Khanan, you're on page 13 in the Hebrew English side. Let's read together. Ad Sof Ashmura Harishona. Until the end of the first watch. Question number one. I'm asking for you to do a little bit of homework. I want you to tell me where, in, not, not now, so for next week. Who's writing down my questions tonight? I need someone to write them down and email them to me. Okay, Marlene and Uziel Vadia, we're going to compare these questions. Okay. Ad Sofa Shmoa Rishona, I want you to tell me where in the Torah, in the Vi'im, Ketuvim, it uses the word Ashmura, Ashmurot. Okay? Now I'm going to read first. I'll read a second time, and then I'll ask you a lot of questions. Right now, we're just going to read. The Gemara says, Mai Kasavar Rabbi Eliezer. Mai Kasavar. What is the Sevara, the, the opinion? Of Rabbi Eliezer, what is his approach regarding how many watches there are in a night? So let's assume that a night is made up of 12 hours. Yes, let's pretend from, let's give me a time, from 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. We're just going to pretend for tonight, okay? That's what we're doing. Even better. Let's do 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. That'll give us even numbers here. I kasavar. Is he of the opinion like Rabbi Natan, which we're going to see later, interestingly enough, in the Talmud? Shalosh mishmarot have halayla. That there are three watches in the middle of the night. If 12 hours are split into three, how many hours are in each watch? Four. Four. Okay, simple math. Even I can do this math. So if you have a 12-hour night, you split it up into three parts, you have three four-hour watches. That is the opinion of Rabbi Natan. If Rabbi Eliezer holds like that, so then answer this question. When Rabbi Eliezer says that you say Shema Israel from when three stars come out until the end of the first watch, when is the end of the first watch according to Rabbi Eliezer? After four hours. After four hours. What is six plus four? Six plus four. Six plus four equals eleven. That's close. Oh, 10. 10, very good. So if Arvid is at 6 p.m., if the, sorry, the sun sets, uh, 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 stars come out at 6 p.m., 
and you have, according to Rabbi Eliezer, one mishmar, one ashmoret to say Shema Israel, ashmura, really, then you have until 10 p.m. to say Shema Israel. What happens after 10 p.m.? The second watch starts, and according to Rabbi Eliezer, you're no longer allowed to say Shema Yisrael. Now, if you recall, all of this is based on the verse of, of how long you can say Shema until when, based on which pasuk? The pasuk in, the, in Shema Yisrael says that you should say Shema when you... When you go to sleep, when you wake up. Rabbi Eliezer says, Beshoch Becha does not mean time when people are sleeping, but rather it means a time when people are going to sleep. Correct? Does it make sense that until 10 p.m. most people are still going to sleep? And after 10 p.m. people are sleeping already? Yeah. I'm not talking about today. Today there's no night and there's no day. Yeah, in a normal organic world, that's the truth. Now, that's Rabbi Eliezer's opinion about the first, so if he says that there's three watches, then he has four hours, which means he could say Shema Yisrael until four hours in. Lema ad arba sha'ot. If that's what he believes, that you have four hours, in the Mishnah, Rabbi Eliezer should have told us, you can say Shema Yisrael until four hours. Why did he say until the end of the first watch? V'i kasavar, and if his opinion is, like Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Arba Mishmarot have halayla, that there are four watches in the night. If you take 12 and divide it by four, how long do you have? How many hours in each watch? Marlene, three, very good. So that would mean that according to Rabbi Yehuda, you have three hours, not four hours, which would mean that if you start at 6 p.m. until what time can you say Shema Israel? 9 p.m. Not for Rabbi Eliezer. Okay. okay. By the way, Halachic Midnight, Marlene, you're right. Halachic Midnight, if the night starts at 6 and ends at 6, then Halachic Midnight is going to be exactly at 12. Mm -hmm. It's why I chose that time. Because if we did 7 to 7, then Halachic Midnight wouldn't be then. That would be problematic. So, 6 to 6. Lema al shalashaot. If Rabbi Eliezer holds like Rabbi Yudha Nasi, that there are four watches in the night, each one consisting of three hours, then he should have told us, Ad, until the end of three hours, not until the end of the first watch. What's the Gemara really asking here? The Gemara is not really asking, does he hold there are three hours to the night or four hours to every watch in the night? What's the real question of the Gemara? The, the Gemara is asking this question. Yeah. They want to be precise with the, with the, I guess, with the sun? What's the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer? Yeah, you're all saying something true. None, none of you are wrong, but think through this uh, with some, me. Some nights, are, some nights can be longer than others depending on the, on the month. Don't answer questions. Ah, we're asking a question first. Uh -huh. the, the, the question is like this. The Gemara is saying, does Rabbi Eliezer say the hours... The watch is three hours or four hours? Is that really the Gemara's question? Yes, okay, how many watches there are actually? Well, okay, they are asking how many watches, that's connected. The question of the Gemara is on the language used in the Mishnah. What does the Mishnah say? Rabbi Lezel says that you could say Shema Yisrael from when three stars come out until. until What's the question the Gemara is asking here? That's ambiguous. Very good. Thank you. That's a very vague answer. Why does Rabbi Eliezer say until the end of the first watch? Why doesn't he tell us how many hours we have? That's the question the Gemara is asking. The Gemara wants to know if Rabbi Eliezer says it's three hours, then he should say until three hours. If the Rabbi Eliezer holds the four hours, then until four hours. Why does he tell us until the end of the first watch? Meaning, what is he teaching us by using this language? Yeah? 
Do you remember we had a similar question about something else in the Mishnah? The word right before Atzov Vashem Alishma. What were the words right before that? We said you can begin reading Shema Yisrael from when? From from three seven. But it's not what the Mishnah says. What did the Mishnah say? Yeah, what does it say in the Mishnah? Someone read to me the Mishnah. The Mishnah tells us from when can you say Shema Yisrael? From when the Kohanim come to eat their Tehumah. The Gemara already asked this question. Why do you tell us that? When do the Kohanim come to eat their Tehumah? When three stars come out. Nightfall, that's right. Why doesn't the Mishnah just say from when three stars come out? And the Gemara answered, because it wanted to teach us something, agav oche kamashmana. It's teaching us something by, by, this, by the way, der agav. It's teaching you two things. You can say Shema Yisrael from when three stars come out, and from what time do the Kohanim come to eat the Tehumah? The Kohanim come to eat their Tehumah, from which time? From when three stars come out. Very good, that's the answer. That's the answer. Milta agav oche kamashmanan. That's what the Gemara says. It's teaching us something else. So here we're having a similar question. Rabbi Eliezer, we're not clear why you're being so vague in this Mishnah. We already answered why you didn't tell us straight up three stars. We're not sure though why you're hiding from us how many hours you believe each watch is, each Mishmar is. Is it three hours? Is it four hours? Why don't you say that, Rabbi Eliezer? Why do you say until the end of the first watch? Is he maybe being politically correct? Maybe he doesn't want to get involved? Yeah, whatever you think, uh, there, you believe like Rabbi Natan, four hours, you like Rabbi Uda Nasi, three hours, I'm not getting involved. Do you think that's what Rabbi Eliezer is doing? No. Wait, don't, don't answer. I'm asking you a question. Could it be that that's what he's doing? Yes. How could it be? How could it be that's what Rabbi Eliezer is doing? When Rabbi Eliezer tells you until the end of the first watch, he's telling you some Jewish uh, philosophical statement, or he's making a legal statement, a halachic statement. So then if he's making a legal statement, then of course Rabbi Eliezer has an opinion as to how many hours are in a watch. He cannot be vague and ambiguous. I mean, the reason why he's being ambiguous is not because he doesn't have an opinion. That wouldn't be correct to say that. So what's the question here? The Gemara wants to know, what is Rabbi Eliezer trying to teach us by not telling us three or four hours? So the Gemara answers. Look at the next words of the Gemara on page 3a. Le'olam kasavar shalosh mishmarot ha've'alayla. Rabbi Eliezer's opinion has always been that there are three hours, uh, there are three watches in a night, which means there are four hours in every watch. That has always been his opinion. V'ha'ka mashmalan and this that Rabbi Eliezer is trying to teach us, that he says until the end of the first watch, until the end of time, Deika mishmarot barakia, that there are mishmarot in heaven. Veika mishmarot beara, and that there are mishmarot watches on earth. What is Rabbi Eliezer trying to teach us? Why does he say until the end of the first watch and not until the end of four hours if that's really his halachic opinion? What is the Gemara's answer? Tell me what the Gemara's answer. He's trying to teach us that there are watches in heaven and watches on earth. How? What? How is he teaching us that? What does that even mean? Someone answer. 
chat, no. I'm not talking about Kohanim anymore. We're done with the Kohanim. Answer my question. My question is, what is my question? What is the answer of Rabbi Eliezer? What, what is the answer? What's the answer? What does the answer mean? Well, I, I, actually, I'm confused why he's using the word Rakia and not Shemaya or Shemayim. Because Rakia to me indicates a physical reality at the time. That there's a barrier of some sort. It's like a scientific thought. Oh, do you want to get caught in the By the way, it's a good question. The, I'm going to start picking apart words for today so we can answer them next week. That's a good question. I'm just wondering, wondering, is he meaning a physical reality as opposed to a metaphysical reality? Is that what he's indicating by that word? Or, I mean, because either, because it's, it's one or the other, it, it changes the whole statement. When he says Barakia, he is referring to angels in Shamayim. Call that reality, metaphysical reality. I don't know anymore what the definition of that is in English. Yeah. Now, but tell me what is the answer here? I heard this. What the Gemara says. So why doesn't he tell us the hours? And instead, he says till the end of the first watch. He's teaching us that even though he believes that the night has four hours, he's teaching us that there are mishmarot in heaven and mishmarot on earth. What is the answer? What does this answer mean? Well, connected to what Yosef uh, Lopez was saying, if Rakia is referring to uh, like a physical place, i.e. what we might call outer space, the solar system, something like that, if it was referring to something um, astronomical or astrological that was believed to be a natural phenomenon at the time, it may have been an accepted uh, viewpoint or an accepted fact at the time, that there were a definite number of divisions of the night that was, you know, an, an astrological or astronomical phenomenon. And he was using that term to refer to those, like, n you know, natural time periods. Okay, let me, so let me help you out. But that's, what you're saying is true, but let, let, me, let me help you out here. The main answer of the Gemara is not about the Mishmarot that exist in the Rakia. The main answer of the Gemara are about the Mishmarot that happen on earth. Define for me a Mishma. What a Shmora, a Shmora, a Shmora. What does it mean? What is the definition of that? We said before, what happens at every Ashmora? What did Rashi tell us? Remember we read this? Thank you very much. This is the answer. The answer is like this. The B. Eliezer is teaching us. Yeah, so what the angels change? You know how many things the angels do? Do you know everything the angels are doing up there? No. But when I tell you that you can say Shema Yisrael until the angels' first watch ends, it tells you there must be something on earth that happens that you can tell when the angels stop doing what's up there. I mean, what is Rabbi Eliezer teaching us? He, all, he believes it's four hours per watch. So he believes you have until Sofa 1 Ashmurah is four hours. What is he telling us by using the term at Sofa Ashmurah Rishona? That you are able to discern when this time period happens and when it ends. Do you understand the answer? Rabbi Eliezer uses the phrase at Sofa Ashmurah Rishona in order to teach you that you can tell on earth what happens in heaven? Yes? Good. Let's keep reading. Yeah. 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 How, can we benefit, how can we benefit from, from knowing that? Very good. How do we benefit from knowing that? We know until when. We're allowed to say Shema Yisrael. Meaning the moment that we see whatever happens, happens, then we know we can no longer say Shema Yisrael. That's how we benefit from this. So now the Gemara is going to quote a Baraita. Detanya. We learned in a Baraita. Rabbi Eliezer Omer. Rabbi Eliezer says, Shalosh Mishmarot Have Halayla. The night is made up of three watches. Wait a second. Didn't the Gemara just ask if Rabbi Eliezer holds the night is made up of three or four? 
So why did the Gemara not bring this as an answer? Because? Because? Because the Gemara already knew this. And like I told you before, that wasn't the Gemara's question. The Gemara is not unsure as to whether or not Rabbi Eliezer believes the night is made up of three or four. Rabbi Eliezer believes the night is made up of three because he said so himself. Ve'alkol mishmar u mishmar. And at every single watch, this language ve'alkol. You can ask some questions. I'll, I'm waiting to ask questions. Let me, I'm going to do the questions. Ve'alkol mishmar u mishmar. Yoshev HaKadosh Baruch Hu ve'shoeg ka'ari. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sits at every watch and roars like a lion. Shneemar, like it says in Yirmiyahu chapter 25, Pasuk 30, where Yirmiyahu is talking about the prophecy of the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Adonai mimarom yishag. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will roar from heaven. Umimeon kodsho yiten kolom. And from his holy abode he will raise his voice. Sha'og yishag al navehu, he will roar, surely roar on his home. Meaning that a Kadosh Bahu, every time there is a watch, he roars like a lion over the destruction of his Ben Migdash. Does it say in the Pasuk anything about watches? No, right? The Pasuk is not about watches. You have to accept. Rabbi Eliezer, he knows that it's a fact that there are three Mishmarot. And so when he sees anything that happens as Akadosh Baruch Hu doing something and three is, he's assuming that it's connected to the Mishmarot. We'll get to that later. Now Rabbi Eliezer adds something from himself. And there's a sign. There's something you can tell on earth how you know when Akadosh Baruch Hu is roaring. Mishmarah Rishona. In the first watch, Chamor Noer. A donkey is Noer. What is Noer? The noise a donkey makes. I think it's called braying, right? B r e i g h. Noer. That's the Hebrew word. You know, Hebrew is not a language like you know, other languages. In English, you say, "I'm wearing my shirt. I'm wearing my suit. I'm wearing my pants." I'm wearing my hat, I'm wearing my tie, I'm wearing my watch. In Hebrew, every type of clothing has its own type of word for wearing. How do you say shoes in Hebrew? Shoes, zapatos, how do you say it in Hebrew? Na'alayim, very good, na'alayim. So what na'alayim? How do you put on shoes in Hebrew? Ani, noel, na'alayim. I am shoeing my shoes. Yeah? I'm putting on my hat. How do you say hat in Hebrew? Kova. So, ani chovesh kova. I am putting on a hat. Yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah, in Hebrew, every type of clothing has its own verb as to how you put it on. The same thing with animals. Every animal has its own word for the sound that it makes. So here is chamo noel. The sound of a donkey is called a, 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 a chamo who's noel. Shnia, in the second watch, kilavim tzu'akim. The dogs are screaming. Let's say that in English we'll say barking. You accept barking? I don't know if that's exact, but screaming literally, but barking. Howling. Yeah. Howling, very good. That's a good word, howling. Shilishit, in the third watch, Tinok Yonek Mishede Imo, a baby nurses from his mother's breast, Visha Mesaperet Imbala, and a lady begins talking with her husband. So there are three signs on earth, and you can tell when every Mishmar ends. The first Mishmar, when a donkey brays. A second mishmar, when the dog howls. A third mishmar, when the baby nurses and the wife starts talking to her husband. We're going to ask all the questions we possibly could ask. I want to read this to get you. Marlene, what was the question? So you're saying these three signs are when the, the watch ends. Uh, I really shouldn't say that because that's a very good point. You're bringing it up right now, it's a very good point. 
So these are the three signs on earth that Rabbi Eliezer is referring to when he says that you can tell on earth what is going on in the Rakia in heaven. The Gemara now is trying to figure out exactly what Marlene asked, which is, which part of the Ashmoa is the sign happening at the beginning, the end? When does it happen? The whole time? The Gemara asks, My kachashiv Rabbi Eliezer. What does Rabbi Eliezer, what does he think? What is his opinion? So here in the Talmud Bavli, we have Ka as two words. Just a note, it didn't make any practical difference, but in the En Yaakov, or Yaakov ben Chabiv, you have there Ka as one word. So what Rabbi Eliezer's opinion? Meaning, when do these times happen? If Rabbi Eliezer says that these signs happen at the beginning of every one of the three watches, why do I need a sign at the beginning of the first watch? It's evening. Meaning, when does the first watch begin? When three stars come out. Do you need another sign when three stars come out, aside from three stars coming out? Don't get the, now. I know with the Jewish communities and the calendars and Rabbeinu Tam, nobody actually knows anymore when three stars come out. But for those of us who still know what it means when three stars come out, do you need another sign to tell you when three stars come out? No. no. So if it happens at the beginning of every watch, then there's one sign that is redundant. I don't need it. The first one, I don't need it anymore. Isof mishmarot kachashiv. And if Rabbi Yezir says that the sign happens at the end of every watch, Sof Mishmara Why do I need the Siman, the sign, at the end of the third watch? Yimamahu. It's daytime. I mean, if you believe that there are three signs that correspond to the three watches in heaven, so why do I need one in the beginning of each one, if for the first watch I can tell already when three stars come out. And if you'll tell me it's at the end of every watch, why do I need the third one? Because I already know that the morning has come. So why do I need, in either which direction you go, you have one sign that is extra, that you don't need it anymore. Yes? So the Gemara answers. The Gemara clearly accepts our understanding that if you go in either direction, one sign is useless. Ela chashiv sof mishmara rishona. Rather, Rabbi Eliezer believes that the first watch has a sign at the end of it. Utchilat mishmara charona, and the last watch has a sign at the beginning of it. So the the first watch, the donkey brays at the end of it. The last watch, the baby nurses and the wife speaks to her husband at the beginning of it. And the middle watch has a sign at the middle of the middle watch. So the first watch has a sign at the end of it. The middle watch has a sign in the middle of it. And the last watch has a sign at the beginning of it. Meaning when the dogs are howling. Let me ask you this question. Uziah Obadiah asked a good question before. What is the purpose of having a sign? What, pra- what do I get from it? So it helps me know when I can say Kiryat Shema until. Correct? Now what does the middle of the middle watch help me with? The middle of the middle watch is otherwise known as Halachic Midnight. Why do I need a sign telling me about halachic midnight? What does it help me to know when midnight is? Are there halachot connected to halachic midnight? Yes. Of course. So it's not a redundant sign, meaning you might think it's the middle of the middle. What does it help me with anything? It helps me figure out when midnight is. If it's for Kriyat Shema, if it's for the Koban Pesach, if it's for anything else that has a a middle night uh, deadline to it, then 
it's useful to have a sign in the middle of the middle watch. So it's not crazy that there's a sign in the middle of the middle watch. And really, you're covered in all bases. The first watch, it starts with three stars ending, that's one sign, and it ends with the donkey brain. You know when the donkey's brain that the second watch has started. You know that the second watch ends when the baby starts nursing from his mother and the wife talks to her husband. And you know when the third watch is over, when the sun comes out, and you know when midnight is, when the dogs scream in the middle of the night. I mean, this answer is actually a brilliant answer. Every one of the simanim help us with something that we actually need to know. The Gemara gives a different answer. Maybe you wanted to answer it this way. That all of these signs happen at the end of the watch, at the end of the Mishma. And if you're going to ask the Chauna lo tzarich, I don't need the last one. What do you need the last sign for? Already, it's daytime. What do I need it for? It helps the man who is sleeping in a dark home. And he doesn't know when is the time for Kiryat Shema. Once he sees that here is a woman speaking with her husband and a baby nursing from his mother, at that point he can get up and read Kiryat Shema. So this is a second answer. The first answer said, then no, the watches, there's a sign at the end of the first one, the middle of the middle one, and the beginning of the last one. This second answer says no, every watch, it ends with a siman. So why do I need the last siman if it already turns daytime? For somebody who's living alone in a dark house, and he doesn't know what to say, Kriyat Shema. So, that doesn't say alone, okay? He's in a dark house, doesn't say alone, let's be honest. He is living in a dark house, and he cannot tell when the sun is rising, so... He now knows another siman for when he can say kashma. But it's a very unlikely scenario. But the Gemara is giving a whole sign for somebody in an unlikely scenario. Let me ask you this question, just very quickly. Where might it be possible that you're living in a place where you don't know when the sun is rising? Has it happened to anybody before? In Alaska, okay, that's very good. Alaska, everybody is Gani Babay Tafel. Everybody's living in a dark house. If you're, if you're in the mountains. Okay, help me out with that one, Baruch. But then, how, how about in the plane? Wait, one second. Baruch, tell me. So if you're in the mountains, how do you know you won't see the sun rise because the mountain may be blocking it till for the first hour? Okay, well, in that case, that's going to be your sunrise. And my mother said in an airplane. I don't know if the Gemara yet knew of this concept of airplanes. But if it's overcast, well, you know it's getting light out there. Okay, very good. It's a, dark, it's a dark day outside, fine. You guys all live in San Diego. That's your problem. All of you live in San Diego. In a prison. Okay, Chazor Shalom, someone is in a prison, very good, that's a great example of when, but I don't know if he's going to hear a woman uh, talking with her husband and nursing from her baby, a baby nursing from her. Let me give you a scenario. I was once staying in somebody's house in Manhattan. They pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to live almost like in a prison. And over there, the house is half underground, half under, you're living in a basement. How do you live in a basement? There's no window in the basement. They turn off the lights. I went to sleep. I woke up. I didn't know if it was the middle of the night. I didn't know if it was the morning. I didn't know if it was the afternoon. I didn't know if I missed Shacharit, if I'm coming from Musaf, if it's already Mincha. I had no idea. That's a real case scenario that happens all the time. People live in basements all around the world. They don't know what time it is. Then not everybody has their phone with them in their bed. So when does he know? He knows when he starts hearing the other Simanim happen. One more time in my life, I did that. I went with my family to a hotel, and uh, I was sharing a room, uh, and they had these room darkening shades. They're lucky I don't have them in my house, or I would never wake up in the morning. These room darkening shades, 
I'm telling you, it's a Kadosh Baruch Hu's gift to people who can't sleep well. You wake up, it could be 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and you would still think it's the middle of the night. It's dark in the room. And you, you don't want to open the window because you don't want to wake up everybody else who's there. Maybe that's a man degani bebait a person sleeping in a dark room. Now let's... Have you can handle a little bit more Gemara? Yeah. Gran? <laughs> let's do a little bit more Gemara. Amar of Yitzchak bar Shemuel. Rabbi Yitzchak, the son of Shemuel, says Mishme de Rav, in the name of Rav. Shalosh Mishmaot have a halayna. There are three watches in the night. And at every watch, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sits and he roars like a lion. And he says, Oy Labanim. Now you should know the sentence here is under so much controversy. Because the Gemara that you have in front of you has been censored by the Catholic Church. And so we are going to have to spend time later determining what exactly it says here. There are some Sephardic versions, some Ashkenazi versions. Some, you have to figure out what is it really. I'm just going to read what's in front of me now. I'm not telling you this is the right answer. Oy labanim, woe to the sons, sheba'avonotehem, that because of their sins, hechravti et beti, I destroyed my temple. Vesarafti et hechali, and I burned my sanctuary. Vihigletim liven umot haolam, and I exiled them among the nations of the world. If you look in some other gear, say, oh, this is, oy sheichravti et beti, woe to me that I destroyed my home. What interest does the Catholic Church have in changing it from HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed his own home to the sons of the sins of the Jewish people, the sons of Hashem, caused the Beit HaMikdash to be destroyed in their sins? Because they became the chosen one. Very good, because the Jewish people, they did a sin, presumably killing Yeshu perhaps. And because of that, the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. We have to figure out exactly what is happening here. Now also this word, umot ha'olam, the nations of the world. In the end Yaakov it says, leven ovdeh ha'kochavim, and others it says, goyim. You have to figure out what is the exact version. I don't want to get stuck on this today. With your permission, I want to read to you a little bit of Rashi, and then ask you some questions to write down, so we can answer them next week. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Let's look in Rashi. Rashi is in the innermost column of this page. It's not going to be in the English. They don't translate Rashi. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I'm trying to see if there's anything I didn't tell you myself. Okay, I want to show you one thing here. Rashi says, Yishag Shal. Yishag, Shaog, Yishag. Three types of roaring. Rashi says, Hare Gimel, there's three. The next Rashi, he writes, Visham mesaperet im ba'ala, and a woman speaks with her husband. Kvar higia karov leyom. It's already beginning the day, the day is about to start. Uvne adam itorim mishnatan, and people wake up from their sleep. This wasn't written here in America. This was written in a world that followed the normal cycle of the sun. And all the people who are laying together, they begin to speak with each other. Okay. Let me go through now and make a list of questions. So the first question I asked you was, tell me where and when the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, use the word Ashmura, Ashmurot, Ashmoret. Look up all of those words, tell me where. I know, done now, the next week. Yes? My next question for you. In the writings of our Chachamim, we switch from the generation of the Mishnah, which is called Ashmura Harishona, Ashmura Harishona. It seems like the Chachamim of the Talmud already have a different word. What do they use? They don't use the word Ashmura anymore. What word are they using? 
Mishmar or Mishmarot, correct? It's the same root, but they're changing words. Let's try to see if we can come up with any reason why the generation of the Mishnah is saying Ashmurah, is using biblical language, and the generation of Chachamim are using a different language of Mishmar or Mishmarot. Okay? And next question. Let's check if there's any significance between the night having three watches and the night having four watches. There's, there's two opinions. There must be a reason for these opinions. Now here, we talk about the roaring of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Why the roaring of a lion? as opposed to another animal. What is unique about roaring and unique about the lion in particular? What is the significance of a Kadosh Baruch Hu roaring? What, is that, what does that mean? Why roar? Why not scream? Why not shout? What is, what is the significance of this? When it says, Al kol mishmar u mishmar, on every watch. Al kol mishmar u mishmar, on every watch of angels, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sits and roars like a lion. Why? Al kol mishmar, on every watch, and not bechol mishmar, during every watch. Why this wording, al kol mishmar? Yeah, we can write that question down. The next question. Yoshev HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sits and roars like a lion, as opposed to standing, as opposed to jumping, what, what is the significance of Chachamim using a word, Yoshev HaKadosh Baruch that HaKadosh Baruch is sitting down to do something? Now Rashi tells us that how do you know that the roaring happens at three parts? Because the verse says, Adonai mimarom yishad, roar number one. Umimon kochoi ten kolon, he'll raise his voice from his heavenly place. Sha'og yishag al nevehu. Rashi says that there are three ways to break up this pasuk, and every one of them starts with the word sha'og, yishag, mentions the word roaring. I'm going to ask you to look at that pasuk in Yirmiyahu 2530. Yirmiyahu 2530. And find for me, if you can extract from there, another way to break up this pasuk into three parts. Okay? Another way to break up this pasuk into three parts. Yeah, 2530. Okay, look at the mishmarot. Tell me what the difference is between the three simanim. Can you tell me what the three simanim are? Okay, the donkey chamor noer, the donkey brays. That's one, right? Kilavim tzoakim, the dogs howl. The third? Haisha tinok yonek mishdeimo, a baby nurses from his mother. Let me ask you this question. A donkey brays, is that singular or plural? Singular. A baby wakes to nurse from his mother, singular or plural? A woman speaks with her husband, singular or plural? The dogs howling, singular or plural? Why? Why is the first watch and the last watch singular, and the middle watch is in plural? Why? Well, I'm giving you questions here that you have to spend a long time looking to know. This is the way you learn a Gemara. You want to understand everything that's happening here. Before we can get into Agadot and the philosophy and Kabbalah, you have to understand what the Gemara says. The second, a question for you is why why does it mention a woman speaking with her husband and not a man speaking with his wife? 
This is a good question for 2021. I can't promise you the answers are all going to be allowed to be recorded. Why does it ask, a, why, why does it say a woman speaking with her husband and not a man speaking with his wife? <laughs> no answers now. If this is a really uh, special, a really special question, I, I, I would give anybody a hundred points if you can find the answer to this one. What is the significance of these three mishmarot at night? What other halakha do we have which is broken up in the middle of the night into three parts? Something else that happens. There must be something else going on in these three. Watch, angels are changing, things are happening. Tell me as many things as you can find that happen in the middle of the night in three watches. My last question to you. My last question. Two more questions. You say Shema three times? Wait, don't answer the question yet. I mean, that doesn't happen all in the middle of the night, Nechama. That happens throughout the day, right? Yeah. So help me find something three times in the middle of the night. Next. I want to Okay, I want to ask you one more question. How could it be that from the beginning of the third watch you wake up to say Kiryat Shema, right? What does he say? The man living alone in his house, he wakes up to say Kiryat Shema. Are you allowed to say Kiryat Shema one uh, 4 hours before dawn? I'm going to give you a hint. I want you to write this down next to that question. Look for the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer in Berachot, Davtet Amud Bet, 9b. Look for when he says you're allowed to begin saying Shema, and then try to justify that in relation to the story here about uh, saying Shema when the woman starts talking with her husband. Okay, that's one question. Next question. Nine, 9b. Look for the teaching of Rabbi Eliezer 9b in relation to when you can start saying Shema. Compare it to what you have over here. My next question. It says that he, the man who's living in the house alone, or he's, he's not alone, but it's dark. The moment he hears a woman speaking with her husband and a baby nursing from his mother, that's when he should get up and say Shema Yisrael. Halachic side, timing aside. It says here, when a woman speaks with her husband and a baby nurses from his mother, what is wrong with this sentence? It's sealed. Okay, let's put sealed aside. What's wrong with the sentence? Compare it to what we, compare it to the wording, what's the third watch? What is the sign of the third watch? What is the sign of the first watch? What is the sign of the first watch? Donkey. A donkey. Second watch? Dogs howling. Dogs howling. The third watch? Baby a baby nursing from his mother and a woman speaking with her husband. What does it say here in this story though? That a man who's in a dark house, that once he hears a woman speaking with her husband and the baby nursing from his mother, then he should get up and say Shema. What's wrong with the sentence? Very good. The order is reversed. I want an answer for why the order is reversed. Why does the Gemara tell you the guy alone in the house, the Siman happens differently than the way it happens before? Is there any significance to that? And I think my last question for tonight. That's a lot of questions. Wow. My last question for tonight. It says, woe to me that I destroyed my home and I burned my sanctuary. I want you to think, look up, think, whatever you want to do. The difference between destroying my home and burning my sanctuary. What is the difference between Beiti, the home of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and Hechali, the sanctuary of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? These are the questions, I don't even know how many, whoever wrote it down, how many questions did we have, more or less? Thirteen. Thirteen questions. No, Baruch Hashem, Simanto. Thirteen questions. Bezrat Hashem, 
I hope to begin answering them for you next week. But let me tell you something. If you don't review this Gemara six, seven, eight times between now and Thursday, next week, Shi'u, you will not understand what is happening to you. Because I told you, we're learning this Gemara seriously. It's not a nice Agarata class. We're learning here Gemara properly. So in order to learn Gemara properly, you have to turn on your head and learn Gemara properly. Every word means something. Every order means something. Everything means something. And only when we begin to understand things properly according to the Peshat, then we can start adding other layers of philosophy and other things to the Gemara. Until then, we don't even, if we don't lay the foundations, we have no right to build a building on top of it or the building will fall down. So I'm asking you questions. They seem burdensome. They seem a lot. Even if you only find an answer for one of them or two of them or half of one, you did your work. You did what you did because you got an answer. And I want B'zal Hashem next week, I want us to regroup and I'll walk you through the sugya again. And as I read to you the sugya, I'm going to begin to answer all of the questions that I asked you today. Yes? Cheva, thank you for learning with me tonight. I'm going to wish you a lana tov. B'zal Hashem. And God willing, I will see you here next week on Thursday evening. B'zal Hashem. Zbach.